Good afternoon. Let's try that again. Good afternoon. That's better in this beautiful Denver sunshine. That's better. Welcome, welcome, welcome. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Debbie Cox Roush, and I'm your director, and I'm just really thrilled to see all of you here today. Um, actually, over 350 for this seminar, so give yourself a round of applause. We're glad you've traveled here to join us in Denver for our second issue focus seminar, Education and Intergenerational Programs. As we're thinking about taking different approaches to our trainings over this last year, we thought about delving more deeply into issues of high priority for our programs, and we thought that'd be a good strategy. It seems to be working. The room is full. Some of you were at our first seminar that we held in, uh, last month in Bethesda, Maryland. How many of you were there? Yeah, I, think, I, thought, I thought I saw some familiar faces. And we held that on elder justice and independent living issues. Many of the directors in attendance told me that they thought these issue-based convenings are a great idea and a good way to learn about the various aspects of the issues in which they are involved. Your participation here seems to prove our thinking and their confirmation, but we always want to hear from you about what you think and what we should talk about and what issues we need to cover. So please keep us informed. Feel free to fill out your workshop, workshop shop evaluations and to make notations and or share your ideas with any of the senior course staff that's here. They're all over the place. So I'm going to be a, be a bit brief today, um, but during tomorrow's luncheon, I will share with you some of the updates about what's happening at CNCS and what I see as the good news and the great future for Senior Corps. So I also want to send some regrets today from our CEO, Barbara Stewart. Um, she had a previous commitment and we tried everything to shift her schedule around, but it just didn't work. But I want you all to know, Barbara and I have many meetings, late night conversations, lunches, where we talk about Senior Corps and the future of Senior Corps. And she wanted me today to ensure you of her ongoing support for Senior Corps. So guess what? She sent you a video. Let's listen. As we considered the topics for these seminars, we wanted to focus on issues that are of high importance to our portfolio. We also want to focus on issues that are high importance to our country. And you know, education and intergenerational programming was near the top of the list. We live in a time where long distance families are, co are not common, so, where are common, so children and older adults no longer have the immediate access to each other that they had in the past. I know when I was growing up, I lived next door to my grandmother. That doesn't happen much anymore. This lack of interaction has resulted in some growing tensions between young and old. But we know that there are tremendous benefits for the young, the old, and for society when we foster these intergenerational relationships. We also know that these relationships don't have to be familiar to, for the old and young to benefit. They only need to be consistent in their interactions. Through our foster grandparent program, Senior Corps has one of the original intergenerational programs of significance and our RSVP programs have also taken up the charge of developing and fostering these relationships. You know, as time change, there are more ways for these interactions to occur. We thought this seminar would be a good way to highlight the success of how we're already engaged, but also to explore some new ways and consider programmings and new innovations. And then, you know, as we were thinking about experts to invite as one of our keynote speakers for this seminar, well, I have to tell you, there was one person whose name immediately surfaced, and that was Donna Butts. As executive director of Generations United, she works diligently to improve the lives of children, youth, and older adults through intergenerational connections and policies across lifespan. She has served on five, let me repeat that, five United Nations expert panels on intergenerational and family issues. She was also a delegate to the 2005 White House Conference on Aging. For three consecutive years, 
The nonprofit Times listed her as one of the most powerful and influential executives in the United States. And Next Avenue named her one of the top 50 influencers in aging. She serves on several gener intergenerational boards and has received numerous awards for her work on intergenerational relations and agwiski. She is called an internationally known speaker, author, and advocate, but in senior corps, we call her a supporter and we call her a friend. In fact, she's such a good friend that she comes to us right on the heels of her own highly successful global intergenerational conference that was held in Portland, Oregon last week. I attended that conference and was awestruck, totally awestruck, by the learning opportunities from the different countries that were there. I think 23 countries came to your conference. The speakers and the enthusiasm for intergenerational collaboration was amazing. It was just an amazing experience for me. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you today our senior core friend, Donna Butts. Uh, I have been a huge fan of the work that you do, and all of us at Generations United have been for many years. And whenever we're speaking about intergenerational work and the history around the country, you're always top on the list because you just do amazing work. And it was, uh, it did take a little bit of thought about whether or not to join you or to join another conference after ours, but when it was senior core and when Debbie asked, there's no way that I would say no. So I'm really honored to be here and also to celebrate all of the service that you do. Everything you do in your communities every day is so meaningful as you touch the next generation. So I want to start just with a really brief story because we're going to keep this kind of tight today. <clears throat> But one of the things we work with at Generations United are called intergenerational shared sites. And those are where you use a space or a facility to bring generations together. So one of my favorite ones that I've gotten to visit a couple of times is in Jinx, Oklahoma. I don't know if anybody's here from Oklahoma or not. But Jinx, Oklahoma has had a program for many, many years. And it's a, a um, continuing care facility for older adults. And the Jinx Public Schools pays for and staffs two classrooms that are at the hub of that senior care facility. So when you walk in, the first thing you see through the glass is the playground, and you see the two classrooms. And every morning, the older adults come out of their rooms, and they line up to greet the students that are being dropped off into the school. So they get greeted with hugs and high fives and glad you're here. It's absolutely wonderful. And many of the grand friends volunteer in the classrooms, and they are reading buddies. So one day, one of the reading buddies uh, was ill and was in the hospital. So the staff went in to talk to the children and said, you know, Grandma Irene won't be here today. <clears throat> She's in the hospital. And so one of the little girls looked kind of puzzled. <clears throat> and then finally she raised her hand, and she said, when she comes back, can we see her baby? <laughs> Why else would you go to the hospital? <laughs> but when you think about the natural interaction that occurs when people are together, it's absolutely fabulous. So let's see if I'm doing, yeah, great. So today what I wanted to talk about, first I, I do have to share with you that one of the things, reasons I love to do a PowerPoint, you're not gonna see a whole lot of numbers on this, but we do an intergenerational photography contest, and so most of these pictures were taken by younger or older photographers capturing the relationship between generations. And I love this, it shows that any, everybody can have fun and everybody wants to have fun. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the wide range of intergenerational programs in particular that connect with foster grandparent, RSVP, and senior core programs. I get to talk a little bit about some thoughts on the future, but mostly what I hope to do is to help you realize what you're doing is so important and that there's so much more that we all can do together in our communities and around the country. So why do I think intergenerational solutions are so important? It's because our society, when you think about it, is held up by the book in generations. Our world is held up by the book in generations, by our younger and our older ones. They really keep our civil society together. And at Generations United, we believe that the most powerful answers to challenges that we face at all levels, whether in your neighborhood, your community, your city, your state, or your country, are those that value and engage people of all 
generations, that they value the strengths of all generations. And in fact, we were founded over 30 years ago when people tried to pit the generations against each other. And to this day, we live by the words of one of our founders, a gentleman named Jack Osofsky, who was at the National Council on Aging, who said, we form Generations United to argue for a caring society. And that's what our mission continues to be, is to really look at programs and policies that connect generations rather than separate them, that really work to connect generations. And as Debbie mentioned, that includes our doing our global intergenerational international conference every two years. And it was just such an honor and thrill that you could join us. It meant so much to people to have a chance to meet you, to learn from you, and have you be a part of that community. So thank you very much. So why now? Why is it that it's important now? And it really is because as these t-shirts say, mixing it up is the new cool. It's the new cool. Old people know stuff, young people know stuff, so let's mix it up. Let's get it together. But I wanted to use an example that when intergenerational work is done well, uh, it really makes a significant difference. And there's a gentleman I've known for many years, a gentleman named Roy Ernest, who some of you may have known, who was with the corporation in the Bay Area. And one of the things that Roy did is he loved surfing and he loved older surfers. And so he started a benefit many years ago in the Bay Area called the Kahuna Kapuna Benefit. And they had multiple different generations in different categories and they did it, it all worked out, they enjoyed it. But it wasn't until he came to our program committee one day that he thought, you know, maybe we need a new category. And maybe that new category should be a three generation team category. And so they started it. They started a team that had to have three generations. So this one year, a couple years ago, this was the, one, the, the winning team. This was their younger member. This was their oldest member. And this is the winning team. And the reason I think it shows what wonderful intergenerational programming can look like is because it's really strength-based when you think about it. The young people may have more energy to get out to a wave, but the older adults know which waves they should go to. They practice together, they work together, they encourage each other, they honor each other. So it's all the things that we think of. It's strength-based, it values what each person brings to the relationship and to the program. It's respectful of all people's abilities and in engagement. It's reciprocal. It's knowing that it's not just one generation giving to another, but it's that reciprocity between generations. It's purposeful. They came together to be in the contest. They worked together, they studied together to be in the contest. So it was planned, practical, and, pr and they were prepared. But most of all, most important, it was intentional. They wanted to be together, they worked together, and that category, that multi-generational category, has now become the most popular of the contest. So when you think about something that you're already doing, think about is there that kind of intergenerational or multi-generational possibility. Now with intergenerational programs, so oftentimes over the years they've been categorized by direction. Which direction of service? So when you think about them, they fall into older serving younger, younger serving older, older and younger serving together, or programming that happens under one roof, like intergenerational shared sites. So as I was thinking today, I thought, you know, I'll focus on Older, older serving younger, because that sometimes is where I get st st stuck when I think about senior core programs. But I was, I was thinking back on some of the programs I've had the honor of being, becoming a little bit familiar with, and also uh, looking through your program book for the next two days, which I think looks fabulous. It really reminded me that you have gone so many wonderful and important directions. And it's not just all about, as I remember my first exposure to foster grandparents, it was in a teen mother program where foster grandparents came in and rocked the babies. They would rock the babies. And what I always like to say is now it's more likely that an older adult wants to rock the boat. <laughs> So this aside, I absolutely love. This is an 82-year-old who's t leading a teenage exercise class. And I think she is probably exceeding uh, the, how the students are doing. But it's, again, it's noticing, knowing that uh, there are all abilities. Now, the program connections 
vary in terms of how much interaction people actually have. I love this. This is in Chinook, Kansas, if anybody's from Kansas. And this is a program called uh, the School Greeters. And in that program, every Monday morning, older adults go to the school and they greet every child that arrives. It's a high five, it's a hello, how are you? We're so glad you're here. You're gonna learn so much today. It's just terrific that you're here. Now, I'm not sure why on this particular day the older person dressed up as a bunny, but you never know. But that interaction means so much, because as soon as the students get in, all the older adult volunteers go into the cafeteria, they have coffee together, they talk about their day, and then they go on with their day. So it doesn't take a lot but it, that little bit of connection sets that child's life off on a positive direction that day. So it's really significant. And then there's more in-depth mentoring. Uh, there's a program called Bridge Meadows, which is older adults living side by side with foster and adoptive families in Portland, Oregon, that I know Debbie was able to visit, and it's absolutely amazing. But what is really great about that program is that they have foster grandparent volunteers that work with the families, that work with the children. Um, there also are a number of juvenile justice involved programs that you folks are familiar with and are experimenting with and making such a difference with. Um, it makes me think about one from Australia that I always liked called Handbrake Turn. And Handbrake Turn was a program that engaged a population that usually you might not think about engaging to work with young people that most people may not want to work with. These are young people who'd been adjudicated because they like to steal cars and the older adults were in a biker gang. So they matched older bikers with young people, and they were tough enough to work with those young people, but what they did was they taught those young people how to work on cars, how to work on something and be close to something that they loved so they could actually get a job working with cars and not stealing them. There's also a great program that was started by Temple University called Across Ages, and that was a program that worked with young people at risk. They had an older adult mentor, and it was more than just a mentor program. They had to do a community service project together. So it was that extra piece that helped and meant so much in that program. Now, one of the, my absolute favorite programs I used to love was in uh, Michigan, and it was called Traveling Grannies and Grandpas. And that was a program started by a woman with foster grandparents that took older adults into home visiting programs with young parents, with teenage parents, and helped them and taught them how to care for their children in their own homes. So it was a great home visiting program. But foster grandparents, RSVP, have also been used to support grandparents raising grandchildren and pro provide the respite and the encouragement that those families need, the support they need. So these are all family support programs, which are even more important as we're dealing with the epi opioid epidemic. And I hope that many of you are gonna go to the July meeting that uh, the senior corps is sponsoring in Ohio that's gonna focus on opioid and the response that we can all be involved with and need to be involved with as this epidemic is, is, is going across our country. So those are family support programs, but also there's the early learning and early, early care programs. And I personally love this picture. The gentleman in the middle is named Tom Taylor. And you may not know Tom, but you know his work. Tom was uh, headed up a child care center and a child care advocacy organization in Washington, D.C. And he is responsible for the first child care center in a federal agency. And so he's the one that really brought those ideas of bringing childcare to the work setting. And he came out of retirement at age 80 and came to work for us, uh, working on advocating for investments in early childhood. And he worked for us for five years. He decided he needed to retire again at 85. Uh, and we still see him, and he still stays in touch. But also the programs involve reading, literacy, tutoring, which is really essential. One that I dearly loved uh, was uh, somebody in, who was a foster grandparent in Michigan who won an award from N4A for his work. He was uh, someone who had a sixth grade education and after his wife died, he felt like he had nothing to offer, nothing to contribute. And he was convinced by the foster grandparent coordinator that he did. So what he did was he went into a juvenile detention uh, school and he started a woodworking class. 
and that became an incredibly popular class. He took a skill that he had that he knew how to use, and he invested his time and his energy in those kids, and they responded. He recruited all of his friends to join him, and it was incredibly popular. But there's also other academics, math, science, and all of the STEM programs. There's a retired scientist who won a Purpose Prize uh, recently, and her whole thing was to ignite interest in young girls in studying STEM. There's also physical and outdoor activities. This is the Intergenerational Games in San Diego County. Once a year, they have third graders and older adult volunteers. They go, they do act, they, they, they form teams, they eat a healthy meal, they have a wonderful time together. And what I loved was the evaluations are usually done in crayon. And one of the evaluations that I saw said, I really enjoyed this program. I never knew anybody over the age of 50 got off the couch before. <laughs> So it's breaking down those stereotypes. There's gardening, there's healthy eating, outdoor activity. There's technology. It's not just young people teaching older people, but there was a 16-year-old who mentored a 92-year-old who was, they were both into arts and learning technology. And he actually, the 92-year-old actually introduced the 16-year-old to some apps that he had never heard about before. So again, it's both ways. There's preserving history, like this project, where a young man worked with an older person who had been t gathering all the stories of freed slaves in Washington, D.C., and was so, so very worried that his work was going to end when he was no longer able to do it. And it was carried on uh, by Kari, by his young mentee. So it's growing those roots, that history. But I'll go back. I'll go back to what I said about wanting to rock the boat. Um, I, we had a, pro a project we were fortunate enough to work with in, in Corvallis, Oregon, that was with a foster grandparent program that had foster grandparents at, a, again, a juvenile um, detention facility. And what I remember from that program were the foster grandparents who were outraged by the lack of supplies and supports those, those young people got. So they were the ones that went to the, city, to the school board meetings. They were the ones that said, you need to invest more in our children. They need supplies. They need to be able to work in their classrooms. So really, again, that voice, raising a voice for somebody who can't raise the voice. And then, of course, intergenerational shared sites, as I mentioned, bring communities coming together to bring, build facilities that connect generations. So why are these important? Well, for one thing, they fight ageism. Now, this is a picture I love also. I mean, I love all these, I guess. But this one uh, is a young child who is in a child care center that is at a senior living facility. So when it came time for it to be Halloween, and this parent said, what do you want to dress up at? As it was only logical, he wanted to be a grand friend. So he is dressed up on October as he is heroes, as the people that he adores every day. Uh, so how we think about fighting ageism, um, the work that you do through Senior Corps is vital in making sure that we can combat social isolation and ageism. And then we also need to remember that it's fun. It needs to be fun. So this is, I always think this is someplace I want to go. I don't know if I could ever blow a bubble that big, but I'd love to go try. So when I think about the future and when I think about the important work you do uh, and what my first thought is when I think about the future is that there has to be a future. There has to be a future. And whether you feel comfortable raising your voice or the people or the constituents that you work with are able to raise their voice, we need to make sure that there's an investment in the Corporation for National and Community Service, but in particular in Senior Corps. As our population is aging, the programs need to, need to be supported, not cut back. So I would just encourage you to always make sure that you're speaking out, that you're sharing your stories, because those stories are what really make a difference. So capture those stories, share those stories. I think it's also important the innovation that I've seen over the years with the work that you do to stay innovative, to stay in touch with today's issues, whether it's the current opioid issue, whether it's the fact that we know we need to better prepare our future workforce with the skills that people learn in the programs that you work with, and whether or not it means that we need to look at community-wide collaborations, uh, like they're starting here in Denver through something called Link Ages. It can be complex. 
but it doesn't have to be. It can be very, very simple. So I wanted to share one last video with you, or actually a video with you, before I close out, um, that shows you kind of a very simple uh, intervention that you might be able to think about ways of working with. So if we could see the video. Do I need to do something? Our students have the chance to travel abroad and to interact with native speakers of English. What our students really want is to speak English fluently. And we're always asking ourselves, how can we make it more real, more human? students with seniors in the USA living in retirement homes. Hello. Hello, hello. Melissa. Hi, Dick. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? How are you today? I'm good. How are you? It's the oh, first yeah. time that I'm talking with someone from another, another country. I'm very excited to be doing this. I look like I'm only 25, but, but I'm, I'm 88. <laughs> Do you have sisters and brothers? No, I'm a lone child. Only one? Oh, you poor fella. I live with my old brother. He has 23 years. Do you know, instead of saying he has 23 years, you could say he is 23 years old. I tried to go to Lula Palooza that we have next week, I think, in Brazil, but my mom didn't let me. Uh, you got a good mom. <laughs> good morning, dear Julia. Good morning to you. This is your dad? That's me and my wife. When we were young. Oh, you were good looking when you were young. And you're still good looking. <laughs> My first destiny is United States, of course, because I wanted to put better my English. Well, you do very well, I must say. Are you planning someday to go to Brazil? Oh, I would like to. Uh, you can stay in my house if you want. <laughs> if you could just dream and have whatever you want, what, would you, what do you think you would like to be doing? I see myself in a big family, you know, with a beautiful wife. You know. I want to thank you for this change of experience, you know. You are incredible. Abracado. You are my new granddaughter, and I love you. I love you too. And if you were here, I would give you a big hug. Oh yeah, let's hug. Oh. Bye. Bye. to turn away because still after all the times I've seen this I cry every time I see it because it's so beautiful. <laughs> but I think that again it can be that simple facilitation of, of connection and communication which is what you're all about. So as Albert Einstein said most people see what is and never see what could be. You're people who see what can be and I honor that. I respect everything you're doing in your communities, and I'm grateful for you. So thank you for this opportunity to spend a few minutes with you, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Donna, thank you so much for being with us. And I know you have to be exhausted from being at your own conference, but we're just so, so privileged to have you with us and, and to hear and um, to hear the stories. I will tell you that um, recently I was named to the Grandparents Raising Grandchildren Council for the federal government, and so I look forward to serving on that. But 
this video I loved because um, Jody Olson, the director of Peace Corps, and I have been having conversations as how can we connect classrooms overseas with our foster grandparents and classrooms here. So those conversations are continuing. So very, very exciting. And yeah, you always show things that make me want to cry. <laughs> so now, I told you Donna's been a longtime friend, but we now have a new friend. And our next speaker is quickly becoming a good friend. At Encore.org, she is responsible for designing and facilitating a national learning network to leverage Encore talent to support children and youth. She has more than 15 years experience working in the nonprofit sector. Prior to joining Encore, she was the national trained director at Temple University's Intergenerational Center. Here, she increased the capacity of diverse teams to create multi-generational leadership for cross-sector collaborations on policies, practices, and programs for intergenerational engagement. It's my honor to introduce to you Karita Brown, our new friend. Good afternoon. I would um, like to begin by introducing you to my grandmother. Uh, this is Frida Brown. She's here on vacation with my grandfather, Bob. Frida grew up in the Bronx in New York, where she worked as an adolescent social worker at a local hospital. She was part of the civil rights movement in the 1940s and a big part of my inspiration for working with older adults. She used to tell me all kinds of stories about her life and her work. And there's one story that I was particularly fascinated by. It was about uh, in 1942, she was part of this civil rights group and she went with another member of the group, um, an African American woman, to a local department store which uh, had had a reputation for not serving African Americans. So they both went to the department store, they asked for the same service, and when only my grandmother was served, they worked with their group to organize a protest outside of this department store. So I was in school and I was learning about the civil rights movement and I was being told it sort of started in the 1960s. So to be hearing these stories of this work happening decades earlier was very eye-opening, powerful for me, big lessons about movement building. And the story always ended in the same way. She would say, with some things, there's just right and there's wrong, and you have to choose a side. And as a child, I would ask her to tell me the story over and over again. I knew exactly how it would end. I knew exactly what she would say. Uh, but there are some stories like that, which I'm very curious about, these stories that we are yearn to have repeated. And they anchor us in some really important way. They represent a certain truth about ourselves, reminding something important about ourselves and about the world. So um, Encore.org, where I work, uh, has a founding story like that. It is a story that our founder, Mark Friedman, tells over and over. It's in his most recent book. It's in his TED Talk. It's at every public speaking event I have ever heard him speak at, he tells a story. And when I first heard him start to tell the story over and over again, I thought, uh-oh, he's telling that same story again. Um, maybe people in this crowd like me have heard it before. Um, but then as he was telling it, I started to feel a very deep emotion welling up inside of me. And I, I scanned the room, I looked at everybody, and I realized they feel it too. And this story is a story about foster grandparents, that foster grandparents and the powerful work that you do are really at the core of our work at Encore. It's part of our initial inspiration for, and the development of Encore as an organization and continues to guide and influence the work that we've done over the last 20 years and the work that we're involved with now. So the the foster grandparents story that Mark tells is not my story, obviously, but I'm going to tell it again to you here today. So when Mark began this work, it was really about um, 
trying to find mentors for young people and children that despite all of the research that was emerging decades ago about the importance of caring adults in the lives of children, there were thousands tens of thousands of children on waiting lists for mentoring programs. And so he started to ask this question, where are the human beings to do the work that only human beings can do, to care and to love for these children? And started looking at the changing demographics in our country and realizing that with this rapidly growing aging population, there was a powerful opportunity to leverage that talent and that wisdom of older adults to fill this tremendous gap. So his first step was to find out, where is this happening already? Where are older adults already being tapped to provide these kinds of meaningful relationships with children? And that, of course, led him to foster grandparents. So a couple decades ago, he took a trip to the pediatric ward at the main medical center. And it's there that he met Aggie Bennett and Louise Casey. So Aggie, she was the tall one, she was four foot 11, and uh, she had retired from her job as a waitress. Uh, Ma uh, Louise had retired from hers at the sawmill. And Aggie often said that she didn't want to rust away. She wanted to wear away doing something useful. And that first day when he met her on the pediatrics ward, she was bounding down the hall dressed in a tiger costume. Uh, and she used to say, it's not a job, it's a joy. So to give you a little context, Maine Medical Center is the biggest hospital in Maine. It's where children with the most serious medical conditions go for treatment. Maine is a very big state, so people often travel hours to get there. And it's also quite a poor state, so many parents weren't able to stay with their children for the length of their stay at the hospital. They had to go back home to care for their other children and to work in their own jobs in the sawmill as waitresses. And so this is where Aggie and Louise come in. If you can imagine being an eight-year-old child, you have a cancer diagnosis, maybe you're in pain, your parents aren't there, and you're in this institutional hospital-like setting. Aggie and Louise came in there to fill the breach. That When Mark met them, they had been working 20 hours a week for the last 10 years. And they would sit with the kids, they would entertain the kids, they would explain things to the kids, and they became more than even foster grandparents. They became true family to these children. Now, Aggie told Mark about this, this story about a time when she had been there about a year, and the director came up to her, the head of the unit, and asked her how strong of a person she was. I'm going to read her words now that are in Mark's book, How to Live Forever. I said, well, I've always prided myself that I was strong. She says, we got a baby that is dying, and we promised her mother that her baby would not die in a crib. Do you think you could hold her? Well, they put me in a room here. They kept checking on me, and that baby didn't die in no crib. That baby died in my arms, and I was always so grateful for that. I didn't feel fear. I just felt good. So I'm, I didn't wear mascara. Uh, <laughs> for this particular reason that even though I've heard this story thousands of times, it still resonates very strongly with me. And that is the key idea that is really threaded throughout Encore's work for the last 20 years, inspired in large part by Aggie and Louise, by foster grandparents, this idea that older adults are an available but largely untapped reservoir for human connection. So, Fast forward now, 2017, inspired by the work that you do, inspired by the work of Generations United, and all the other incredible work happening around the country to connect generations, we launched the Gen to Gen campaign. In this campaign, we're seeking to help change the national conversation around aging. Instead of the many ways in which aging is framed as a burden, 
or a challenge. We're looking to show the many ways in which aging society creates a powerful source for social good and to lift up and celebrate and amplify the connections across generations that are happening every day. I don't need to tell you that. And you look because you are a huge part of that. Senior core, foster grandparents, RSVP are tremendously powerful stories of older adults as resources for addressing some of our society's most pressing problems and doing the work that only human beings can do, providing meaningful connection with children and youth. So I want to tell you a little bit about the campaign. CNCS, RSVP, and Foster Grandparent Associations are all already a part of our network of over 200 partners. But I will let you know now that even though the organizations you are part of are already partners, I'm going to ask each of you personally in your own role as leaders to sign up for the campaign and join us. So get ready because that ask is coming in a little bit. But for now, let me talk a little bit about the campaign. It has three main elements. The first is a little bit what I was talking about before, telling a new story, moving away from this common thread we often hear about around generational conflict and age segregation. We're doing that in a number of ways, through media stories, through op-eds, through research, and through Mark's most recent book, How to Live Forever. How to Live Forever is based on this idea that we live on, not through these new technologies that extend our life indefinitely, but we live on in our legacy when we pass down our wisdom and our experience to younger generations. So there's so many impactful stories of the work of Senior Corps volunteers. Uh, for example, I was recently reading a beautiful story in the Clarion Herald about foster grandparents helping with student outcomes, creating this loving environment for children in New Orleans. If anyone is part of that story, deep congratulations to you. And also read a fantastic article that came out this month in The Messenger about an RSVP program in St. Paul, helping students with their public speaking skills and building their confidence as youth, as youth leaders. So your work is already deeply embedded in this work of storytelling. The second part of the campaign um, is around spreading and scaling our impact even more broadly. So we imagine or envision that every school is engaging older adults, every community center intentionally connecting the generations, every child care center accessing a extra layer of support with older adults, every senior center providing opportunities for older people to connect with youth. So that it completely becomes part of the fabric of our everyday life. We would like to see generations connected through our housing, through our transportation, in our public spaces, and everywhere we go have opportunities to connect across generational and other historic divides. So this is the kind of scale that we believe is necessary to truly combat this growing epidemic of loneliness and isolation that research is showing is sometimes more debilitating than risk behaviors like smoking. And while we have known for years that older adults are uh, facing social isolation as an enormous challenge, new research and data is also showing now that this is deeply impacting children and youth as well. So this kind of scale is necessary to help improve outcomes for youth facing tremendous and growing inequities in their access to quality education and necessary to bridge deep, long-standing divides that are in many of our communities. So we're working on spreading these practices and ideas in a few ways, encouraging new innovations, new programs, new strategies for connecting the generations, and also taking what we know really works, best practices, and working with large-scale networks, youth-serving organizations, local governments to help spread those practices. In the city of Los Angeles, for example, the RSVP program there is a citywide hub for intergenerational connection and resources. They provide training and support for youth-serving organizations on how to effectively engage volunteers, and they have a wide range of intergenerational opportunities for older adults to engage in. 
We've also been working recently with a national school-based program called AVID, which is helping low-income students succeed in school and increase in college access. They're in 6,000 schools around the country serving 2 million children. And historically, they've had a large core of volunteer tutors who have primarily all been college students. But over the last couple semesters, they've been experimenting with engaging older adults in this role with tremendous success. In fact, so successful that they're rewriting their whole volunteer tutor manual to include strategies for engaging older people. And AVID is one of a dozen organizations that are seeking to shift their volunteer models from exclusively college-based to more of a multi-generational volunteer core. And the majority of these volunteers at AVID, they're from RSVP. So you've also been instrumental in our work on innovation and scaling efforts as well. The third part of the campaign is about building a movement. One of the things we've learned from Senior Corps and others is the power of the team. There are lots of people doing work around the country to connect the generations, thousands, maybe even millions, but so many of us feel like we're doing it alone. And you know from your work that it can't just be one person. We need to have a critical mass, have people be part of a team climbing this hill together. We often hear from people who connect with the campaign who are doing incredible work, but they feel like they're doing it totally alone and are asking us, you know, where are my people? Where is my tribe? And so we're hoping to create opportunities to bring people together so that they understand that they're part of something bigger. And so we are asking you to join us. This is the part I said would come earlier. Um, we're asking all of you to stand up and raise your hand and say, I am part of this bigger movement because other people need to hear your stories and to be inspired by you and think, oh, I could do that. I could be a part of that. To help us bring those who are more like they're dabbling around the edges and they're not totally sure what to do. So we hope that you will join us. Uh, this is how you can imgentogen.org, sign up to get more information about the campaign, get connected with others, and share your story. And I hope that some of you will join me this afternoon for a workshop that I'm facilitating, especially for those who are placing volunteers in early care and education programs, which is a specific area of focus for our campaign. It'll be a very interactive session with both of us there as teachers and learners to explore opportunities and challenges related to engaging volunteers in early care and education, but particularly focusing on how we can build and leverage the social innovation efforts that are emerging in this space. So to close, I would like to say that in these turbulent times, there is so much at stake to ensure the health and well-being of younger generations and older adults as well. And as Grandma Frida says, you have to choose a side, and you all have chosen remarkably. You have chosen connection, you have chosen interdependence, and you have chosen love. And you are helping create that village, a web, a web so powerful and so important to all generations. So my deepest gratitude and respect to you for all that you are doing and looking forward to diving into deeper conversation with you this afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you, Carita, Senior Corps and the Senior Corps Associations. Um, just so you all know, we have a memorandum of understanding and work with Encore and, uh, for Gen to Gen. So I look forward to having deeper discussions with you, Carita, um, about how we can collaborate together. So let's give both of our speakers a round of applause. You know, I know that I'm always energized and inspired by their work, and I could hear some of your brains ticking. But you know, that's why we need to hear from them so we can go back to our home bases with ideas for how to engage our volunteers in new or newly revised innovations and activities. So that brings us to the close of our luncheon today. But before we close, I have a couple things I'd like to do. Um, sorry, Brian, this wasn't in the game plan. Um, I would like to introduce three other people that are sitting at our table today because I think you all, if you haven't met them, you should, and that is the presidents of our association. Janine, who's the president of our Foster Grandparent Association. Don't be shy. 
Maria, who's the president of our Senior Corps Association. And Betty Ruth, who's been with us just for a short time, I'm not going to tell Betty, from RSVP. They do have tables in the hallways, but they've been a great source to me and, and a great and good partner. So I wanted to make sure all of you in the room know who they are and you can give them hell or whatever you want to do. I'm just kidding. No, I'm, just kidding. I'm just kidding. Let me mention that we'll be back in this room this afternoon um, at four o'clock. I'm still getting used to this Denver air. I don't know. Is anybody else affected by it? But Jill, I told you I was fine, but you know, anyhow. We'll be back in here at 4 o'clock for a session on learning from your peers that will be moderated by Jill Sears, our acting uh, senior core deputy director.